Hey, this is Matthew Bates, professor of theology at Quincy University uh, here in Quincy, Illinois. And uh, I'm excited to be speaking here with you guys uh, about the exegesis of Ephesians. Dr. Matthew Bates. Matt, good to see you, my friend. Hey, thanks, David. Yeah, it's always great to talk with you. This is the second appearance now on Exegetically Speaking. You were with us a while back talking about Romans 1, 3 to 4, which is one of my favorite uh, early passages there in Romans. But today we're going to talk about Ephesians, which is just fascinating because it seems like everybody I've been talking to lately wants to talk about Ephesians. So we're talking about chapter 1 today. What's going on in chapter 1? Yeah, so I I selected Ephesians for you because this is just what I happen to be reading this morning. So uh, maybe the Holy (laughs) Spirit is is moving many of us to read Ephesians these days. If uh, some of your other guests are are working with Ephesians, they are. Yeah, they are. Um, Yeah. So in Ephesians one, Paul starts by introducing himself, obviously, and then he moves into this whole sequence where he speaks about um, how God um, uh, is worthy of the the title being blessed. Right? Uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he begins to speak about all the spiritual blessings uh, that we have in Christ, and uh, these connect powerfully to language of of God's foreordaining choices and things like that. Uh, But uh, I was going to focus on the end of that passage, which is one um, long passage in Greek, uh, and most uh, most editions of the Greek New Testament don't uh, actually have a a final punctuation until verse 12, which is the end of a long sentence that begins in verse 3. So Mm -hmm. it's a a lengthy sentence. So I was going to jump into uh, verse 11 here, uh, because I think there's some interesting things, uh, both in terms of syntax and in terms of theology. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and read a little bit. Yeah, yeah. in ho kai eklerothemen, pra aristentes, kata pra thesen, tu ta panta, inerguntas, kata tein balen, tu thlematas autu. That would be verse 11. In whom also uh, we were called, uh, having been foreordained. We had that language that we also find in 1 5 uh, mm, mm-hmm. as this language um, that has to do with um, bounding in advance um, or a boundary language. Uh, according to uh, the purpose, the prothesin, of uh, the one who works out all things according to the counsel of his will. And then we have uh, a, a prepositional uh, clause with an infinitive, ace ta ani hemas, and uh, this is usually understood uh, to be um, something along the lines of in whom also I mean, we were. We were, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, we, uh, as it's the hemas, not the humas there. Uh, for the praise of his glory, uh, ace apinon doxe sautu, tu pra elpicatas el in to Christo, those who uh, hoped in advance in mm. Christ, mm-hmm. right? Um, and the thing that's interesting is then in verse 13, uh, we have the in ho kai humes, uh, and the humes is kind of left hanging there, in whom also you. And um, our, most translations will say something like, in whom also you were included. Um, and I think that's the right sensibility, as it seems to be the same structure as we find in verse 12, yeah. being kind of presupposed in verse 13. Um, and so the idea is that just as we were included, you know, uh, also you were included. But the thing that's interesting is the theological rationale Paul gives. Having heard the word of truth, here in Greek then, mm-hmm. akusantes ton logon tes aletheos, and he clarifies that, the gospel of your salvation, ta euangelion tes soterios uh, humon, in hokai pistusantes, in whom also you, uh, having believed, as fragiste te to pneumati tes uh, epangelias to hagio, you were sealed in the Holy Spirit or with respect to the Holy Spirit of promise, it mm-hmm. says. Mm-hmm. And so this language is interesting because Paul seems to see a sequence in the text, I think, by which we come to be included in uh, God's foreordained choice. And I think that's um, one of the things that's not noticed maybe in this text um, or theologically um, underappreciated. Mm-hmm. Uh, so mm-hmm. I like the way you said it earlier in our conversation that that the idea of the, the predestined is not a fixed number exactly. Yeah, it seems to be in this cho- in this text. Then uh, the in whom right language that we have in this in this text like is pointing back to the Christ. So it's the language of the King. Right, mm-hmm. and we should remember that this language of the king is not equivalent to the language of Jesus. Right, um, the king is Jesus, but it's in the king because we're talking about before 
this king took on human flesh as the person of Jesus. Like we're talking about the foreordained purposes of God. All right. So we're speaking about something that happened before the incarnation that God had intended all these things to happen in the king, whoever that king might happen to be as that king took on human flesh as a person. Um, so Paul has this language of foreordination, but it's attached to the king. Right. Um, and so, yeah, one of the things that's interesting in this text is that there are there seems to be a historical sequence by which those come to be included in the foreordained purposes of God. First, it was us, but then it's actually uh, you, right, who are included after having heard the word of truth. So the number of elect, the number of who are foreordained seems to be a collective category that's expanding here. And I think that's one of the things that's fascinating in the text. It's not just a fixed number that once we reach that number, too bad for the rest of you kind of stuff. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that. It seems like Paul wants to pin election on the Christ. He's the chosen one. He's the elect one, right? And that we then are called in him and are elect to the degree we find ourselves in him. Mm. And that's why those who, after having heard the word of truth, that they come to be attached to him or are united to him, then they are elect too. They're called too. They are then experiencing salvation also and are found within that foreordained boundary. So in verse 13, when you look at that word, who may, Sinho Kahumais, that word means you, you plural. Mm -hmm. Who do you think that's referring to? Uh, the the you uh, yeah. probably like Gentiles. I think would be probably especially the idea. The Gentiles living in Ephesus, living or the ones receiving yeah, it would hearing depend. the letters. Right. Yeah, it yeah. would depend on um, yeah how we understand uh, Ephesians, whether we would understand that to be originally directed at Ephesus, but we also have that textual variant right at the beginning of the letter right. that makes that a little bit unclear. Um, and there are a number of New Testament scholars that theorize that this was a circular letter. Um, yeah. And that maybe Colossians was written first. This was maybe directed originally at Ephesus, but maybe with a broader purview. Maybe um, some of the, the cities around Ephesus were also to be included in this letter, which maybe explains why Paul doesn't greet anybody personally right in the letter. Mm -hmm. So we have you know, different different New Testament uh, scholars will construe the exact audience differently. But yeah, I yeah. think in light of um, some other things that we find in Ephesians, like especially like the end of Ephesians 2, right, where Paul talks about the, the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile, right, and how that's been destroyed in Christ, right? Um, like, it seems that the you part would be the, we were the first to hope, meaning we who are Jewish we, people, Jews, especially. right? Uh -huh. Yes, and then, then we would have the Gentiles being included among the Ephesians, who are those who are further described in chapter 2, who were without hope and uh, were children of disobedience, right, as Paul um, mm. uh, speaks about that, or children of wrath. I don't remember his exact language off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fascinating reading of this text. Man, we, we got a lot done in a short period of time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, Paul doesn't even stop there, right? He oh, he keeps going, on, doesn't he? he yeah, he does. Keeps yeah, going, because he, he talks about the Spirit as the Aravon. Right. Yes, uh, and so we have that the powerful language of the down payment on our inheritance, right? Yeah. Uh, and that that is for the redemption of of the. It says in Greek for the redemption, uh, the the asopolutros and taste uh, the peripoiesios. Yes. So the peripoiesios there is um, usually translated the possession, the idea that the inheritance of the possession, meaning that that the full salvation that we'll possess someday, uh, seems to be in view. And then all of this, of course, is for the praise of His glory, asopinon taste doxes out too. Yeah. And that uh, sort of. Uh, ends out uh, the yeah the the full sentence there in Greek and you know that's a refrain that is that the third time it's happened that that refrain uh, to the praise of his glory to the praise of his glory it's been several times but it seems to come back like a refrain uh, yeah in the in the text itself yeah yeah, yeah I, I wasn't counting them as I was reading this time so I hazard to guess <laughs> I, I think, right, it I think it's about it three times something like that yeah, three yeah, that's yeah. a perfect number so you might as well be three hey yeah. Dr. Matthew Bates thanks for being with us today and helping us read Ephesians 1 just a little bit better hey thanks David what a great conversation I hope you agree now there's only 168 hours until the next podcast drops so watch for it subscribe to this podcast rate us today if you want to study biblical languages, you need to consider Wheaton College. They have the best program in the country, bar none. Go to wheaton.edu, look for modern and classical languages, get started today. Come on, you know you want to. Thanks for those who make this podcast possible. John Lonsma is our Wheaton-based director, Ian Rosine and Rebecca Larson. Thanks to Phil Keke for our music. Until next time, thanks for listening.